Welcome to another episode of Movie Mastery! That's right, it's the podcast where we're watching movies that you make us, and I'm your host, John, with me, as always, is my co-host, Jeff. Hey, everybody, you make terrible movies. Why would you do that? <laughs> Quit making movies to send us, they're I, terrible. I, I appreciate it, I think you're very ingenuitive, or is that a word? Yeah, sure, but please stop, just send us movies, there's so many already. Also, there's so many of them with your wieners in them. I just, I don't need to see. How many wiener movies can we get? The answer (laughs) may shock you. But this time around, we watched John Carpenter's classic, Mm. They Live. Yeah. 1988. One of my favorite movies. Yeah. Uh, I mean, my number two John Carpenter film. Okay. I I know your number one movie permanent of all time is a John Carpenter movie. Oh, yeah. I yeah. mean, the thing is, unimpeachable. Yeah. And this movie is... Impeachable? Pretty, there's, there's some impeachable elements. Uh, There's some weird things, I feel, that go on in here mm-hmm. that are done in service of the movie, though. Uh, don't get me wrong. I think this movie is fantastic. Um, Of the John Carpenters, I'd say it's maybe my third favorite, but that's because I have a special appreciation. Ghosts of Mars, obviously. No, well, no, not even. <laughs> not. I can't even go that far. I have a special appreciation for certain levels of trash. That's too much, but vampires is not. <laughs> so, <laughs> so for me, it goes the thing, vampires, then this, and then Assault on Precinct 13. God, I love Assault on Precinct 13. Man, I love fucking uh he did in the masters of horror series Mm -hmm. on i think it was showtime they had a whole bunch of horror directors just do hour-long like short films yeah and his also fucking great Uh, he's a good director he's very economical he he definitely uses exactly what he needs to tell the story uh, which I which I appreciate with a horror movie because there's there's no extraneous elements. There's it, it's a spare, lean, hungry movie that that uh, gets in and gets out, and it feels good doing it. Oh yeah, and I mean, I'm, granted that we are describing a movie with a seven minute fight scene in it, but it, it, and even then, <laughs> it, it doesn't feel overindulgent or anything. Now the, I mean, it is a little overindulgent, but that's kind of the point of the scene. Yeah, I mean, here's the thing. I took a lot of classes on horror film okay. in college. Mm-hmm. Uh, I also took a class literally just on John Carpenter. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be rad. And so I have things to say about this movie. <laughs> Good. So when we get past the initial uh, impressions and we actually get into the full spoiler review, I'm probably going to get like a little like film crit in here so it might get a little less blow by blow let's make some jokes and a little more well you see the uh, the choice to do the mise-en-scene in this it's uh yeah it is definitely a movie that i love Mm -hmm. and it's also you know i think with john carpenter one of the things is he does basically everything in the film like he writes and directs and produces and does the music and don't get me started that is the thing about him being like considering himself a score wizard is that he's right twice (laughs) he's he's made like 13 movies and he was right to do his own score twice (laughs) it is it's just amazing to me that he's like you know Fuck it. I don't need to pay anyone else. I'll do it myself. I got a Casio here. And you're like, man, <laughs> I can uh, tell you do <laughs> hire someone <laughs> that said, you know, the spare Casio music. Uh, uh, that's one of the reasons that Assault on Precinct 13 is so high for me on my list of John Carpenter films is that the music in that is phenomenal. It's spare and it, it, it adds to the tension dramatically. This uh, uh, maybe it adds to the tension. But boy, oh, boy, we're going to talk about the score on the other side. And I cannot wait. <laughs> yeah. I mean, even in this film, uh, I mean, the, ha- the screenplay writer is credited as Frank Armitage, mm-hmm. who is a person that does not exist, <laughs> because John Carpenter was like, I don't want to just have my name show up like seven times in a row, mm-hmm. so I'm going to make up names for people. Nice. <laughs> I mean, half of you who have seen this movie are like, oh, right, I just remembered the score when you said that. <laughs> I mean, probably not, because... It's one of the most forgettable scores in that it is just sort of... I'm looking forward to forgetting it. It's plotting in the background. It just keeps on going. It's the same blues riff for an hour and 20 minutes. (laughs) (laughs) 
I got to assume that guitarist got real tired. Oh, wait, it was just a keyboard. Yeah. There was <laughs> definitely no way anyone touched any other instrument. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I mean, Roddy Piper, Keith David, mm -hmm. both excellent in this. I'm a huge fan. I know this is going to be a weird one, but as far as character actors go, this has a major role in it for Brandon Buckflower. George Buckflower. Jo I'm sorry, George Buckflower, uh, who, Brandon Flower is in my head, but he's the lead singer of The Killers. Yes. So, okay, we're back on speed. That's why it was in my head. Uh, George Buckflower, who almost invariably plays a homeless guy. Yes, he's uh, almost always the homeless guy who pours out his alcohol because he has seen something. Yes, I love him and everything, and, <laughs> and he, he true to form in this, although he gets a secondary role as well, which I really like. Yeah, no, I, I think he does great. Meg Foster is in this mm -hmm. as sort of a love interest who I was trying to place who I, where I had seen that before. Mm -hmm. She was Evil Lynn in Masters of the Universe. <laughs> So she's worked with Frank Langella. Indeed. Okay. The legend. Yeah. The the man, the myth. Frank Langellan. The, skele the skeleton. Uh, but yeah, so I highly recommend it. If you haven't seen it, I think it's very good. Uh, and I mean, at this point, it would be hard to really spoil any of the surprises in this. It's like saying you know, Darth Vader is Luke's father. Like, that's just sort of a cultural thing that what? exists. What? <laughs> <laughs> but I just got here from my se my time machine in 1978. The uh, the rumor mill on the magazine circuit is that Boba Fett is Luke's father. Ooh. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, I think, you know, that's about it. I've gushed enough mm -hmm. in the beforehand. We're going to play a wee bit of music. Maybe some John Carpenter music. As <laughs> <laughs> long as it's from the wrong movie, I'll be fine. Uh, and we're going to be right back with our full, in-depth review of They Live. We have returned, and it is time to get into... John Carpenter's They Live. Yeah, we came here for two reasons. Uh, I only came here for one reason, <laughs> and, and it was to review They Live. <laughs> and we're all out of reviews. Oh, no. Well, that <laughs> thanks for joining us, I guess. <laughs> uh, this is a great movie. I don't. I mean, normally I don't like horror movies, but this this one is really good. It's not even really a horror movie. It's more of a like a, a an action comedy slow burn message movie i mean it's basically political commentary sci-fi yeah that's that's better yeah uh and i do like we've got our our good friend rowdy roddy piper star of stage and screen two movies as far as i'm aware i can't think of a third one uh yeah i don't know yeah it's this and hell comes to Frogtown. He's definitely in another one. I'm sure he is. He I just is don't for know. sure in some other one yeah. that I've seen. Mm -hmm. Last wor uh, working role, as far as I remember, was Saints Row 4, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. voiced as himself. Yep. And uh, Great, great video game that actually gave him the reunion with Keith David that you would want. That's, what, that's all you want, honestly. Yeah. But uh, playing a character called Nada because they don't ever give him a name in here. Yeah. He's just Nada in the credits. Mm-hmm. And so he's sort of the stand in for the everyman. And we even right away when he's talking to Keith David towards the beginning of the film, he's like, well, I believe in a hard day's work. And as long as you put in your time and, you know, you you try hard and do everything right and you play by the rules, then I believe the American dream will come true. And all you got to do is get out there and work, which is funny because he opens in this film as a uh, a hobo for out of Denver who who used to work out of Denver but can't anymore because all of the uh, whatever the mills have the, shut uh, down. mills oh yeah it was mills for him yeah so he's he's uh, he's pretty desperate and it opens on a big old railroad track and he's walking down the rails so you really know what kind of guy this is goes to an unemployment office where a snooty unemployment lady which is a weird stereotype like normally in unemployment offices they are eager to help you uh, and uh, and and then finds himself at a construction site yeah and. You know, we are supposed to, with the beginning here, at least see, okay, not only is he supposed to be like, oh, this is someone who's very down on his luck, yeah, but also 
with that line, with seeing he's going to the unemployment, he's straight up just going to job sites and being like, I have tools, put me to work. Yeah. Like, he is the ideal boomer idea of what you should do mm-hmm. to get ahead in life. He's the 80s Tom Joad. And, uh, and I mean, I'm going to try and match your uh, your film crit energy. I hope you don't mind. <laughs> oh, that's great. <laughs> but he's just out there to put in the work and try to live the American dream, even though clearly his dreams have been deferred. <laughs> mm. Mm, makes, makes you think. <laughs> <laughs> Trenchant. Uh, Trenchant and commentary. Ooh, d- d- digging trenches and commentary. <laughs> but he uh, he does his whole day's work, and that's where he meets Keith David, mm-hmm. who lets him know about basically a shanty town that exists. No, it's like a it's a, a homeless shelter in a kind of a vaguely. What town is he supposed to be in? Do we know? Uh, we don't ever really know. It's some major town that is. I want to say probably supposed to be in the South because I believe Keith David says he comes down from Detroit. Detroit. That said, Detroit's north of almost everything in, in the United States, so it, it could easily... Yeah, but also, it, yeah. I think uh, Straight down. Piper says he came down from Denver. Oh, okay. So yeah. I, both of them went to the South, so maybe well, something like a San Antonio oh, or... The, Denver is also the Mile High City, so it could be that while one of them moved southward, the other one merely moved to lower elevation. <laughs> Makes you think. Makes you. <laughs> forces you to For- think. <laughs> in, Obey. Enforces thought. <laughs> think. Stay awake. <laughs> yeah, so anyway, they, they're in some town. Some hard... Uh, but it looks like a homeless shelter like the kind I've seen in Seattle or Portland. Yeah, I mean, it is, honestly, to me, it just looks like the old Hoovervilles. Yeah, no, it does. It looks like a shanty town, but you see more of those in in uh, in the Pacific Northwest. The shanty town that still has, like, a functioning shower system built into the middle of it and a kitchen area. It's just economical to, you know, people already have tents. They already have lean-to kind of setups. Oh, yeah. Just, it, you know, you don't lose money on property taxes and so on. You can build them in vacant lots and move them when you have to. Exactly. So it made a lot of sense. And there's a, you know, a church next door, and it, it very much makes sense to be like, okay, yeah, this is going to be like a charity thing for this church to be helping out. Yeah. So uh, I do like, though, that even with... Uh, Row- <laughs> Rowdy, Ro- I want to say Rowdy Roddy Piper every time I talk about him. Like the whole thing, every time. That's his wrestle. That's his wrestle name. His real name is Dwayne Johnson. <laughs> Turns out his real name is The Rock. <laughs> but pretty sure you just call him, you know, Piper or Roddy Piper. You probably can leave the Rowdy out. Is that his real first name? It I should da- be. It could be. He is. Uh, this movie made me more aware than I'd been in the past of exactly how Canadian he is, <laughs> which is so much. Which is pretty canadian pretty darn canadian (laughs) i should have known from the whole you know the kilts that he's always wearing when he was a wrestler i always just assumed it was because he was trying to adopt in like scott scott persona but he's not he's it's that's a mounty thing that he's doing isn't Ah. it uh but yeah even with the whole him being like oh i i believe in the system and everything He's still wary, like when Keith David's like, yeah, you can come with me to this place. There's hot food and a shower and everything. Oh, yeah, he has that line, that that great back and forth where, where uh, Keith David's like, I don't like a man following me. And he and he's like, I don't like following a man unless I know where I'm following him to. Yeah. Or something. And it's so, you know, both of them being down on their luck and hard scrabble. And there's even the point later on where, you know, Keith David is really laying it out for what it's like in the world when you don't have anything and it's just like you're born in the world and they say all right go live life and everyone is on the same race as you but they're all trying to screw you over to get ahead if anything the start of this movie i I hate to say it it feels weird uh but the start of this movie kind of sets up rowdy roddy piper or nada as kind of a douchebag to keith david where Keith David's definitely helping him out, and he's accepting the help, but then Keith David will come over and be like, man, I, I I got a wife and two kids out of Detroit. I ain't seen him in six months. The world busts you down. And the whole time, Piper's whole reaction is just kind of, eh, huh, okay, eh. Anyway, sucks. He just <laughs> No, his whole thing is, I believe in America and the yeah. system because I haven't had my eyes oh, open he gets, yet. He gets he gets one line dragged out of him, but for the most part, he's, he's serving more of a sounding board for Keith David than anything else. Hmm. 
which I, I it's definitely on purpose, but I thought it was it was interesting in the early going, especially because later on he's going to be the one to have the major turn. Oh yeah, and I mean it is definitely there as like it's much easier for say a black man to understand that the system is stacked against you. Yes. Then a white man. Yeah. I I really kind of was hoping for more of that commentary towards the end. I mean, everyone knows what this movie is. They find out that half the population is like these no skin monsters from, from Andromeda. Um, uh, and I really wanted a line from Keith David. That was like, who gives a shit? <laughs> They're the same thing as white people. I mean, the thing <laughs> is fucking Keith David basically has that. Where he's like, it figures. <laughs> yeah, that's right. He does have that line. <laughs> yeah. And, the the weird thing for me is th- that Nada immediately like starts nosing in on the whole weird stuff that's going on at the church. Yeah, his whole everyman persona f- frays a little bit as it ca- as it comes into contact with the movie's plot. Because he's just like, wait, I think there might be transpirings of what? I'll stick my nose in them. And I'm like, wait, didn't you just say you believe in not sticking your nose in things? Well, yeah, but I'm bored. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, it's definitely a thing where when you are watching that and you see him start being like, oh, something weird is going on at the church. And he like borrows or buys some kids binoculars so we can spy on there. Yeah. And, you know, it looks as if he's probably even missing work to just hang out is what it looks like yeah it's pretty clear that the next day he seems to have all day to hang around the 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 camp as opposed to go back into the i I feel like he got there on friday yeah it must be so we know he gets paid on thursday yeah uh but anyway yeah he he sneaks in there and gets caught uh and then and then he sneaks back out gets some, uh, some binoculars stares at the place for a long time keith david comes out to be like what are you doing man you're messing with the good thing yeah. this this camp is a good thing don't fuck with it yeah no very much like hey these are the people that are giving us food mm-hmm. and a place to stay and showers and everything the fact that you are essentially just spying on them for no reason and barely spying at that because it's not like he sets up a hidey hole to binocular oh, no, from he's just sitting on a wall <laughs> he's in plain view of the church just like yep i'm gonna do this till i figure out what they're doing and you're like come on man have some like subterfuge or something nope i'm an every man and every man don't hide and we get uh some bits here where uh Of course, one of the main things in the background during this whole movie is there's a lot of commercials. Mm -hmm. Uh, We see a bunch of TVs, but we never actually see shows outside of the news. Yeah, you see news and you see commercials. I think you may see a couple other things here and there that are just indefinable TV. Like the opening TV that they show at all when he's huddling in the alley because he hasn't found out about the shelter yet is just some woman talking about how much she loves being famous and how important it is. Remember that where she's just like, I love being famous because then people have to look at me and I get to be seen. Actually, Mm -hmm. that is about how she likes watching TV because she can think she's famous. Ah, very good. Okay. She can pretend that's her. So she's being interviewed on the news or something and she's like, uh, all right. Yeah, that's, again, playing into the whole thing of staying asleep, not having an imagination, just letting your identity be television the other thing is all the commercials are fake and made up for this and they're all very good they're all they all lean way in on the decadence like they're all commercials for rich people by rich people they're all like uh you know oh fancy fabrics are out this year even more fancy fabrics are in give yourself over to delicious decadence Ooh, the roaring 90s are coming and with them buttons (laughs) (laughs) jombi the chocolate icing (laughs) Yeah, no, it's it's great. And then the the news is even better where they're like the guys like I think a grand new land of prosperity for prosperians is coming and he's like, "Oh, this is laying it on." Oh yeah. And in the middle of that, we do get at the start some break in programming where someone is pirating their signal in saying mm-hmm. like, "You guys are all being led astray. They have us under their control. The signal makes you complacent and weak yeah you also have a blind street preacher saying the same stuff yeah like the exact same stuff verbatim there's a there's a really cool scene where the hacker uh 
TV station breaks through and he's talking and uh, at, Piper can't look at him for too long. Apparently, the hacking break the, the breakthrough causes headaches in people who are watching it. Yeah, apparently stopping the signal that is getting beamed into your head hurts. Yes. So so uh, he's looking away and he sees this street preacher guy who he'd seen before and the, the street preacher is mouthing the words as they're said. Yes. At the exact same cadence, which is a cool, creepy moment. Uh, but they're all in on the same thing. It turns out they're all part of the same underground resistance, which for the moment is manufacturing the famous sunglasses out of that church nearby. It's so weird to me that when he goes over there the first time and he's like, oh, I got to find out what weird thing is going on here. There's boxes of sunglasses. He's not like, oh, I guess they're selling sunglasses then <laughs> and fuck off. Instead, he's like, no, man, something weird's happening. Well, the, thing, the sunglasses are clearly like Ray-Bans, right? They're big old 80s Ray-Bans. They're just big honking sunglasses. Yeah, and so his thought, I, I would have thought if I had encountered sunglasses, is like, oh, these guys are selling black market or a bootleg or stolen sunglasses, and it's just one of the many ways that they scrabble up some cash to pay for the whole shelter operation. Oh, yeah, I mean, there's a actual, like, little science station with, like, you oh, know, yeah, Erlenmeyer beakers. flasks and shit, yeah. <laughs> and you're like, oh, okay, you're making sunglasses. Like, it looks like, oh, they probably just got whatever cheap glasses they could get, and they're doing some chemical thing to put the, uh, the polarizing, the polarizing yeah. agent in there, and... Instead of being like, oh, okay, I get it. He's like, no, man, Keith David, let me tell you, something weird is in there. They don't have singers. It's just a tape recorder. I mean, that part is admittedly kind of weird, that they pipe they pipe uh, choir music out of the church 24-7 so that they don't get heard by local police radios or anything while they're they're doing their plot stuff in there. And if anybody comes by, they're like, oh, they're, there's currently someone in there doing, uh, like, some session yeah. I shouldn't go in there and interrupt them. And they're hiding sunglasses behind false walls in the church, too. So there's definitely something going on. But he gets captured even on his first visit. He gets he gets uh, run into by a blind that blind street preacher who admittedly is not trying to like threaten him or anything because he's an underground recruiter. So it's just like, hey, man, hey, hey, come on, brother. It's OK. You can stay and talk to me. Let me feel your face. Let me feel your hands. Oh, you're a working man. You got working man hands. You should probably, you know, be on our side. Yeah. And, you know, Piper gets scared and dashes on out of there. Yeah. Now, eventually the uh, the police show up and you get the full like riot police helicopter and they've got a bulldozer. They are bulldozing the entire, like, little shanty town down. If you stripped out just the scary helicopter shots from this, it'd be like 11 minutes of helicopter footage. They, they clearly, I, I'm sure they shot it all in one day. They rented a helicopter and just did every shooting. But they really want that helicopter to be an oppressive force to give you an idea of just exactly how ubiquitous the, the uh, invasion is. So there is so much helicopter. Oh, yeah. There's there's a lot of shots of helicopter and of cops, cops and bulldozer. Yes. Yeah. And they they are they are here because they have discovered the secret uh, of the sunglasses and they're going to bulldoze this shanty town because it's an oppressive, suppressive force. And it's, you know, a <laughs> it's one of the things where when you're watching it, you're like, I, I get it. This is this is definitely, you know, before you get into the reveal of aliens, the hey, it, it, shit just sucks even for, like, without weird sci-fi shit. There's cops in here. They're, like, just beating up, yeah. like, the street preacher, like a blind preacher they are beating up. Yes, yeah. And uh, at this point, Keith David is still too entrenched in his fear of the, of the uh, you know, he, he needs to protect his family. He's still thinking about the family back in Detroit. So when the invasion happens, Piper is... is invested in trying to help people around the camp or to at least figure out what's going on in the church or something so he tries to get keith david to help and keith david's like uh, -uh and he runs away no i'm look don't blame <laughs> i don't blame him no hey i'm a black guy and i can clearly see the police are beating up a white guy over there so i'm out of here yeah he does not want a part of this and piper ends up saving like one guy dragging him into like some squad apartment uh, yeah. and, and watching what's happening after the whole disaster, as people are picking up the wreckage of the uh, bulldozed uh, facility, he sneaks back into the church and steals one of those boxes of sunglasses that was hidden behind a false wall. Yeah. Now he doesn't know 
what's actually in there. He thinks there's something under them. He, he's still under the impression that the sunglasses are a front and that there's drugs or money or something hidden under the glasses. Yeah, because he takes like this box and goes to an alley and, you know, opens it up real secretively. But all there is are these sunglasses. He digs through it. There's nothing there. But even with that, he's like, all right, there has to be something about these. So he like puts it in a trash can and then covers it over so that no one else sees it. Mm -hmm. And then he goes out onto the street. And I was really worried because this movie does have a tendency of everyone not being willing to put those fucking sunglasses on for even a second that he would like not put them on for the next 20 minutes of the film and just wander around with them in his hands thinking about them. But thankfully, after a couple of steps, he's like, "Ah, I have a pair of sunglasses. At least I'll put these on. Oh, yeah. And that's when it all gets rad. Yep. Then he sees in stark black and white how all of the signs, all of the billboards, everything around him is now set up to say, you know, obey, marry and reproduce. Consume. And, you know, like the money when he looks at it just says, this is your God. Yeah, yeah. This is what you want on all the magazines and that kind of thing. And, and it takes him a while to encounter one of the uh, the invaders. I mean, you can call them aliens, because they're clearly from Andromeda. I mean, they are. Yeah. They're aliens. It just feels weird to call them that, and I'm not sure why. I, I think it's because they're so well entrenched. But but yeah, the the aliens, he, he finally encounters one when a rich guy comes to the same newsstand that he's at and buys a, a, a newspaper. And this is when we get our first look at the at the alien outfits in this movie, and they are ultra cheap, and yet it doesn't hurt that bad. Oh, no. They are so cheap. They are cheap, but also very effectively mm -hmm. weird looking. It just gets worse when they talk. Yes. Whenever they talk, the, ma the mouth either moves too little or not at all, and you're just like, ah, oh, come on. Ah. <laughs> Especially because the, the, the alien effect in this, it's, it's always shown in black and white. Well, you do see it in color. Uh, you, wait, like at the very, very end when, when the, uh, the signal's broken? And a couple other times. Okay. But yeah. Oh, that's right. There's when they get. The, I think when they get the uh, the contacts. Yeah. But anyway, for the most part, they're in black and white. But they are, they look like humans without skin. Is all they really look like. They have some. They have bone. They have muscle tissue, and they have big uh, orby eyeballs. Yeah. But they basically just look like humans without skin. Uh, and that's enough to you know that's still absolutely freaky. So he's like goggle eyed staring at this guy. Oh yeah, and I mean, there's, it's a gif you've already seen of him like. He puts on the glasses, he takes them off, he puts them back yeah. on again, he <laughs> takes them off. Yeah. And it's this great moment where between this and the convenience store that he then goes into. Yes. There is this complete break with everything that he thought he knew. And so everything he's seeing, he's just stumbling around being like, all right, well, this is this is a lot to take in. <laughs> yes, no, for the moment, he's mostly just shell-shocked and wandering around trying to figure out what the fuck's going on. The real galvanizing moment is when he sees a newscast. Oh, yeah, well, there's up on a TV in uh, this convenience store that he goes into that is fairly bougie because there's a lot of these aliens in there. Yeah. Uh, there's a politician up there who's like, the old ways are done. The old cynicism is gone. It's a new America where everyone's looking forward. They're trying to do their part. They're working hard. And he's like, yeah, I figured it should be something like this. And this this is the funniest thing about the movie for me is that this galvanizing reaction to getting pissed off about what because he sauces out what's happening. The aliens are controlling things and these glasses let him see it. Yeah. Uh, and, and the f first alien he encounters after that, he's so mean to, and it, it, it triggers his transformation from every man to one liner machine. Oh yes. And, and his one liners is... are terrible. No, that's the thing about him <laughs> is he goes from seeing the world, the way he's supposed to see it yeah. to now seeing the way it is. And when that happens, he has an initial break. That is very interesting because he, I mean, I don't want to gloss over the fact that he insults this lady, which is wonderful. There's insult. All I'm saying is his one-liners like, are hilarious. His first you, one. You're you, okay. You real fucking ugly. Yeah. Well, his first one is, lady, you look like you fell into the cheese dip in 1957. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just like, what? And then they just keep going like that. You look like you got boiled in formaldehyde. 
And she already is on her two-way wrist radio being like, yeah, this guy can see me. <laughs> yeah, come, come and get this guy. Yeah. And that's when a couple of cops show up, which are both aliens as well. Mm-hmm. And they try, and at least initially it seems like they're going to try and recruit him. Uh, which I assume is their usual go-to it, in the rare occasions that someone can seed through the, uh, the the waves or whatever. is uh, I mean, they, their, their thing is, they are like, hey, man, this doesn't have to end like this. Why don't you just put the gun down and come with us, and we'll all talk it out. And I'll tell you what, anytime a cop says that, they're just going to drive you somewhere else and shoot you there. So <laughs> I'm not... I'm not uh, I don't think that they were trying to be like, hey, maybe we can recruit this guy. I think they were like, let's not shoot a guy in public. There's well, paperwork. I mean, either or, because they're also <laughs> like, you know, this could be good for you. Let's pull a curtain before we punch this guy's time clock is I'm fairly certain what they were actually saying, especially because he doesn't give them an inch. He's just kill- still going in on them with like, you guys are so fucking ugly. And they have a response that that I think haunts the rest of the movie, which is he's you look the same to us. Yeah, yeah you look exactly as crappy to us, pal. <laughs> and <laughs> I mean, at this point. Piper doesn't even have a gun. Like, he has to steal the gun initially from the cop. Well, yeah, because he's made his transition from working every man to... Oh, Action right. hero. Oh, wait, he's a professional wrestler. We all forgot. The, this dude can't play every man and also have his shirt off. No, he... Piper is a sculpted monster man. He becomes immediately an action hero. Mm-hmm. And not in the way that another movie would do it. If this was a Schwarzenegger type thing... Mm-hmm. He would have been like that from the start. Yes. And he would have stayed that way throughout the film. But his sort of action movie one-liner bravado thing is only for this sequence. Yeah. And it becomes his sort of reaction to having his world shattered is, okay. I'm going to be like I'm a gonna, movie. I'm going to become like something I know. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's pretty great. Uh I really appreciate the physicality of Piper in this. Um, he, because he's like the last of the wrestlers who had like a normal guy face, as opposed to having you know a, an extremely muscle neck and face. Like so, when he's got his shirt on and he's got like a heavy flannel on over his shirt and everything, you're like, he's a big dude. Yeah, he's a big muscly dude, but he looks normal. And then he takes his shirt off and you're like, oh fuck. Oh oh, oh. no, you're a slab of meat. Uh, oh, that is that is an extremely cut gentleman with a normal doe face. <laughs> also, not to belabor the Canada thing, but. I gotta, I gotta say, I, I think the reason he's in so few mo- movies is because Piper sounds. If you close your eyes, he sounds exactly like Dan Aykroyd. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> I, I wasn't gonna mention it, but there are definitely a couple lines that he delivers in here. I'm like, fuck, that is so Aykroyd. <laughs> it's the weirdest fucking thing. He sounds so much like Dan Aykroyd, and he's this giant muscle monster. <laughs> Uh, but the famous line when he manages to get the cop's shotgun and he goes into the bank and he's like, I am here to chew bubble gum and kick ass and I'm all out of bubble gum. Right. One is delivered in such a way as to be believable as this is a guy trying to come up with what he thinks a badass line is. Yes, and I, and that move that line has been adopted as a a representation of badassery, and I think like by you know a bunch like Duke Nukem shit and stuff like oh, that yeah. for decades. And I I don't know that it works that way. I think it's intentionally that he's saying something dumb because he doesn't really know how to be an action hero. Exactly, <laughs> he's trying to be something, but he's like, all right, what would sound badass? Mm-hmm. What would I, I don't know. What would they say in D- Death Wish 2? Oh, yeah. Or some this other is, movie that's come out at this point. This is definitely like a person who's like, I have a shotgun. Yeah. And I should be Schwarzenegger right now. Yeah. But I have no idea what to say. And it, in the delivery, like the fact that he kind of does it monotone and pauses before doing it, he's like, and I'm all out of bubble gum yeah and no one reacts is the other great thing no one's like oh shit a badass they're like what the fuck well, I mean, is they, this guy doing they move from stunned that a man with a gun has walked into the bank to stunned that a man with a gun has walked into the bank it didn't really matter what he said at that point they were all like ah oh, fuck the bank's being robbed i hope i don't get shot so and then he, when he stops and he's like ladies and gentlemen and everyone's like it doesn't he's probably gonna say this is a robbery everyone get on the floor and instead he says something fucking weird and they're still like well we're still getting robbed though right that's clearly still what this is yeah everyone's like 
uh. <laughs> <laughs> and then as soon as one of them starts trying to like move, he's like, all right, I'm going to blast every one of the aliens in here. Yes. And that's when we get our first scene of uh, alien twists his watch and teleports away. Yeah, we get one teleport in the scene in the movie that's not done by the good guys. And that's this alien who's like, uh, he just goes, ah, he didn't get me and just teleports out of there. Uh, it's the one who he turns to because they're trying to call on a phone and like call for help or something. And he turns to them and goes, ah, mama don't nope. like, oh, it's a different guy. Okay. No, that's, that is the invisible drone that he says that to. Oh, okay. Mama don't like no tattletale. Yep. <laughs> Another again, one of his, one of his classic, not quite a one liners. Oh yeah. And the thing that breaks him out of his one-liner, I need to be an action hero and shoot him up, is when he meets a cop that isn't an alien. Right, because he shoots his way through the bank and then escapes out the back as more and more cops are coming piling in. Then he gets cornered in an alley by a human cop who's like, hey, buddy, hands in the air, and he gets a gun on the cop before the cop can draw his gun. And he's just like, put it down, beat feet. Yeah, he like, has one last here. one-liner, beat your feet, and and then he's like, I gotta get out of this. I can't, I, I can't shoot humans. That's not what I signed up for. Yeah. And it's it's at that point that he's like, oh, it's not just everyone in any part of authority is an alien, but there are people that are complicit in this. One thing, as long as we're jumping around a little bit here and there, one thing I found amusing was towards the end of the movie when it, when he's meeting up with the Resistance gang, and I think his name is Gabriel or something, the, the uh, Gilbert, the guy Gilbert, Gilbert the guy who's uh, like the person who had been running the shanty town, but but now is just like the leader of the underground. Yeah, his is like, hey, look, they are recruiting other humans. They bring them in, and most of these idiots, most of these fucking assholes, sign up immediately. And I'm like, oh well, yeah, they aren't wearing fucking glasses. If some dude's just like, hey, you want a free promotion and a million dollars? <laughs> well, usually they'll recruit you because either you know or you're getting high enough in society that there's no way you won't find out. Right. But well, I mean, when I first saw that, I was like, wait, why are you mad at them for accepting pay raises and, and, and cushy jobs? I mean, that's just that's just the fucking 80s, man. Uh, but then when you finally get to the next scene where they jump to like the uh, the secret underground where they're it, you know, telling the rich people how rich they're about to be. You're like, oh, they are telling them. They're like, hey, we're aliens and we're colonizing your planet, but you'll make a lot of money. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, in the underground passageway to get there, there's alien writing. They go past basically the teleportation airport to space. Yeah. Like, it's very clear that everyone that they bring on knows what the deal is yeah no i just found that fascinating because because i was taken out of it for a second when he was like these assholes sign up immediately and i'm like well yeah because they're they're it's a secret it's a secret that they're aliens all that's happening is high-powered people are coming to random folks on the street and being like hey would you like to work for me for a shitload of money except uh, that's not what's happening no no but you re that's revealed shortly thereafter and I, it, it made me feel better right at right when they get to that scene it's like oh okay now i'm on board again so I'm just saying, it was a journey that I appreciated. Okay. I'm not saying I was I had a stupid misinterpretation of the movie, no. which I would normally have had. I mean, you mm -hmm. did, but then you were disabused of that notion. No, it was correct. It, it was a well set up thing where it made, it I it asked it forced me to ask a question and then remove the question from my mind again. It was really? fine. Okay. Because when I saw the scene, I was like, no, it very much just sounds like. They are recruiting specifically people like us. No, I get it. The, the, the problem with that kind of thing, and this is the same, uh, maybe it's just because the 80s weren't quite as conspiratorial as the 90s and 2000s have been, but um, when when they're like, when, when I hear, oh, the aliens recruit you, and then they tell you they're aliens, and then you keep it a secret, I'm like, no, you fucking don't. No, you fucking don't. That's why you can't have real conspiracy theories. That's why Sandy Hook can't have been an inside job, because if 700 people had done it, one of them would have fucking talked by now. Yeah. <laughs> uh but yeah this is the thing where it's basically you find out what's going on and either you are paid off and on board or you're dead yes yeah so it was it's fine i'm just saying it was an interesting moment for me i appreciated it i'm not i'm not complaining oh yeah if i'm complaining about anything it's bow 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 Bom, 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 which is the only music in this movie and it repeats every once in a while it stops for a while and you're like oh it feels so good and then things get serious again with bom, bom, bom. you're like oh fuck fucking fuck <laughs> at a certain point I, I was like wait 
is the blues music in this intentionally repetitive and boring and drony to add to the level of oppression and paranoia? Is this an intentional choice? Yes. I know it is, and I still don't like it. <laughs> uh, we also get after his final break where he's like, oh, I can't just be an action hero. Mm -hmm. uh, he gets into a car with a woman and is like, all right, one, put the glasses on. All right, you're human. Great. I need you to drive me. Just drive me somewhere. Because, mm -hmm. you know, he's just some guy. He's not like, oh, yeah, now I, I have a cool action hero plan. He's like, my plan was to just start murdering them. That was stupid. And, and now I don't know what I'm doing. It's lasted longer than I thought it would. I should have gone out in a hail of glory a while ago. So instead, he hijacks a woman in her car, forces her to drive him to, to, to her house, and this is uh, our, our I, I guess you'd call her a love interest, but she's really not. Well, no, she's set up as the love interest. Yeah, but the movie diverts from that pretty heavily. Uh, and, and she is interesting because she what she gives him right away is a treatise on what being kidnapped has done to her. Because well, he, he's just like, look, lady, I'm sorry this is happening. I just need to lay low in your house for a bit and I'll leave when I can. And, and she's like, you don't need to be sorry. You're not sorry. You have a gun. You're in charge here. You have the power. And when he's like, put on the glasses and you'll see what I see, he's like, regardless of what I actually see, I'm going to see what you tell me to because you have a gun. Yeah. I kind of wanted him to, you know, because he's like, yeah, that's a really good point. Never mind. And I, I still want him to be like, yeah, still put them on. Because, I mean, look out the window. You're going to see all the, si the, the signage that's going to say, like, obey and shit all over everything. Watch TV for a minute. I don't care if you believe me or if you feel like you're being coerced by me or not. I'm going to turn you to this cause. Even if I leave, you'll come around later. <laughs> Instead, he's just like, yep, that's a real good point you just made. Coercion is definitely the name of the game when you're being kidnapped. Anyway, I'm going to lie here and rub my eyes. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, I mean, at this point... It's established that wearing the glasses for a long time fucks your head up real bad. Yes. So he's tired. He's on the run from the cops. He's, I mean, as a regular person, he's just murdered several, albeit aliens. This is definitely like the first time he's probably ever done anything like that. I wonder if he ever had a moment where he thought to himself, wait, what if the glasses aren't showing me aliens? What if the glasses make half the population look like skeleton people? What? You know, just that they, they just, when you put the glasses on, like half the people you see just look like skeleton people, but they're not just, you know, just for a moment where he was like, wait, what if everyone's actually human? And it's these glasses I'm wearing that make people look like terrifying skeletons. Oh shit. If that happened, I just murdered a lot of innocent people. Well, I mean, I think the scene where one of, he when one of them teleports the away is, yeah. yeah, there is that. But I think the scene in the house where, you know, Holly's just being like, yeah, you're, I mean. Say whatever you want. You're not the hero here. You're a kidnapper and a murderer, and you should probably understand that. And it's a great scene because it is, again, that subversion of I'm the action hero. Instead of it being like, oh, this is my cool lady who's going to fall in love with me and I'm a badass. Instead, it's just, no, you kidnapped someone. This isn't a movie. You fucked up. Yes. And and it plays out like that because she manages to gain his trust by talking about what she does for a living. There's a because she works at a TV station and he's like, oh, shit, they put the signal right in the TV. And he walks over to, like, breathlessly explain what's happening to her. And she hits him on the back of the head with a wine bottle and knocks him out of a third story apartment building and down a giant Hollywood looking hill. Yeah. Honestly, I think they might be in L.A. just because there's so much TV stuff happening where they are. I mean, the the house where. He gets knocked out of very clearly hill Hollywood is Hills. Very Hollywood Hills. Yes, <laughs> it's like fucking BoJack Horseman's house. <laughs> yes, it's. I think there may be a strong argument that they're in L.A. Yeah, uh, but yeah, he tumbles down an entire like hillside. Is super fucked up from that, and very clearly dropped the glasses at the house. Yeah, and we get a momentous uh, uh, momentous occasion of her looking at them and going, "Oh, the glasses are still in my house," which is an important setup for later, which is really well done. Well, yeah. And we also have this moment where she's on the phone like reporting what happened and you're not really able to tell is she reporting this to just the police 
or to some alien overlords. Uh, it's the same thing. The police have been fully infiltrated, well, but yeah. we don't know if she's turned or whatever, what the deal is. He, uh, at this moment, I think he doesn't quite get the idea that there may be some humans that are voluntary collaborators. Oh, yeah. To this him, is, he's like, oh, if you know what's going on here, clearly you would try to stop it. Just like any other true-blooded everyman American who works for a living. And he has yet to understand that most people aren't that. That yeah. is that is a made up Norman Rockwell ass concept. If someone comes up to you and says, "Hey, here's two million dollars, and all you have to do is nothing," yeah, then you're like, "Great, <laughs> so I love it." Yeah, so he's he's slowly being disillusioned about everything, not just that there's aliens conquering the world, but also that the world is making it so easy. Oh yeah, when he sees not just that there are cops that are working with them that are humans, but there are you know regular everyday working people that are working with them yeah it's the idea that it's not just that they are brainwashing everyone it's that they have help yeah this is it's cool and it's also nice to watch a hero take some real serious battle damage in a movie because this guy falls down three stories in a hill and when he gets up it's he is limping he is hurt he hides underneath the balcony of another house until he sees cops and then he's like uh and the the pain the, clearly in pain as he tries to get up and, and limp away from oh, yeah. the line of sight honestly good reason to cast a pro wrestler i gotta say he's selling the pain and it's well done oh yeah and the that limp follows him for like a full day yeah like we see him sleeping in an alley and he has to like physically with his hands pick up the hurt leg and move it yeah so it's it's uh it's well done physical acting on on piper's part honestly i wish this guy other than the acroid voice had had shown up in a few more things i mean honestly until you hit the rock so many of the wrestlers turned actors were so bad well yeah most of them are i mean you got hulk hogan who was way too egoy to to be a real action hero oh yeah because he's not willing to make any movie unless it's a movie about how nice hulk hogan or his persona happens to be whereas roddy piper will absolutely have a movie where he starts out an idiot and also gets the shit kicked out of him john cena started by being way too self-serious and and trying to be jingoistic and gung-ho by making like the oh, marine he was and shit. basically like the new hogan he was trying to do that shit and i think he's realized what the rocks path looks like and is now trying to with well, the peacemaker performance is now basically trying to copy that yeah he's like oh wait i can just be irreverent and curse a lot and be fun and, and have fun with it cool i'll yeah. do that and then almost every other wrestler is like they probably shouldn't be acting like you've heard what what fucking the undertaker actually sounds like <laughs> this is the worst idea you've ever had niles <laughs> and of course the greatest wrestler of all time died too soon and did do a couple of movie roles but you know oh bone andre. Saw. No. <laughs> <laughs> fine andre also put on an amazing performance at least once yes and uh macho man randy savage my personal favorite wrestler of all time uh of course got got to be in sam raimi's spider-man you're yes. on the wrong side of history <laughs> spider-man <laughs> Uh, bone saw is ready although he's at i'm sorry i'm doing the jazz fingers but he only does the jazz fingers when he says uh you're mine for the next three minutes <laughs> god i fucking love i hate them both i don't really like the raimi spider-man movies come at me america uh but i fucking love his performance and basically all the villains yeah tell me mcguire can suck an egg well there you go and kirsten dunst can suck a different egg <laughs> two eggs uh, two eggs please but, smash mouth also eat those eggs <laughs> eat those eggs they did I got to appreciate Smash Mouth, right? I got to praise them like I should. <laughs> uh, so at this point, he goes back to find the sunglasses, because now that he's, he's lost his pair, he needs to find new ones. And this is basically a slapstick scene? I don't mind it. It's just funny that it happens. Well, he this is him basically hitting rock bottom. Yes. Because he's like, all right, I'm fucked up. I'm now digging in the trash such that I will now actually crawl into a trash truck mm -hmm. to try and find these. I love that. I mean, I was watching this with headphones, so I heard it pretty well, but uh, the, the trash truck driver is preoccupied because he's in an argument with someone else about, like, union work or something. Oh, it's the, the guy who's actually throwing the trash into the back. Right. So he's digging around in the back until he finds the sunglasses, and then all of a sudden, the argument that the two trash guys are having comes to a head, and the, their resolution to the argument is to dump the truck's contents into the alley and drive away. Well, here's the thing. I love it. They don't know that the back is open. No, no. Because Piper 
opens the back. That's true. You're right. They do, but still, why would they lift up the the bat the bat the back of the truck if they don't know the bat? Are they just like let's shake the trash around for fun? Well, yeah, <laughs> they're just like, well, we'll just I don't know, move the the dump truck thing and then go. <laughs> Anyway, yeah, uh, he, this is basically to set up that he only gets one or two pairs of glasses. I think he only gets one. Um, I mean, he has he has the box, but he honestly just takes the one. Well, I think he, he when he lands on the bottom, he, he looks around for a second, finds the one pair that was in his hands when they get dumped out of the truck, and then he goes, ugh, and he looks around the rest of the trash, gives up, and walks away. I think he, he wasn't going to keep digging for, for glasses, uh, but then... He, at this point, he has one pair again, and he goes off to find, and I know they gave this guy a name, I don't remember, Keith David's character has a name yeah. in this. Uh, I forget what it is as well, but I can look it it's up. It's probably David Keith. <laughs> it is Frank. Frank. So he goes off to find Frank, uh, because Frank has been a, a helpful soul, and is also a huge muscle American. And is also the only person that he is on friendly terms with that he knows how to find at this point. Yes. Because he knows about the construction site. But Frank is still in I don't want no trouble mode. Oh, yeah. He's like... Hey, you're on the news for murdering people. Get the fuck out of here, mm -hmm. which is a perfectly normal response. Yeah, and he's pleading with him for help, eventually gives up and walks into an alley, and Keith David shows up again and confronts him and is like, hey, and throws him money and goes, here's one week's pay. That's the best I can do. Get the fuck out of here. Lay low. And I'm like, God damn, that is a good Samaritan. Oh, yeah. Frank in this movie is basically the best person yes like he's not the protagonist of the film but he is definitely the hero of the film and he has the most disappointing conclusion in the movie out of anybody i mean oh, I know yeah. it's, it's what's needed but it is so sad that it happens the way it does uh but yeah he's just like here's a week's pay get the fuck out of here and the response a seven minute fight to try and force him to put on sunglasses and amazing I, I keep waiting for keith david to be like fine if you're gonna beat on me for several minutes give me my one week's payback you yeah. <laughs> and it just never gets mentioned again uh the the great thing with this fight i mean one as mentioned before it is basically like a six and a half minute fight with no background music mm -hmm. nothing else going on just Two very muscly people, very realistically fighting each other. Yes, and you're you know you're actually kind of happy. There's no background music because it would have just been boom, boom, boom. <laughs> I mean, even if you had regular action hero movie music, <laughs> that would undercut it because again, the whole point of this is no, we're trying to be like this is real. This is this, this is, is what happens if you actually try and fight society. Yeah. Well, it's notably, they have a, a a huge, long, drag out fight where they keep getting knocked down, which in an action movie means the fight's over. And then the other one's like, "Fuck you, buddy!" And they get up to walk away. And then the person who's hurt just goes, Ugh, "I'm not unconscious." It would take so much more to knock me unconscious. <laughs> yeah. You can't just knock someone out with one punch because we're both, you know, pretty big guys, and nobody's here just getting hit with a baseball bat or something. This fight isn't done. Yeah, so they just keep getting up and starting again. It reminded me a lot of uh, that second episode of the of uh, Daredevil fight, you know, the the, hall, the, uh, hallway, the hallway fight, fight. Where, yeah. where he just kept having to knock these guys down over and over again as they kept getting up. Huh? And you were, just, you were just like, oh, shit, this is very... I mean, granted, it's Daredevil bitting the shit out of a Bratva in a, in a, in a, a, a safe house, and yet somehow it feels very visceral and realistic. And here it's a, a professional wrestler beating the shit out of Keith David, and you're still like... Fuck, you feel every punch. Oh, and I mean, it's not even him beating the shit out of Keith David. Keith David beats the shit out of him. One thing they don't mention in this movie that I kept waiting for them to drop is that either one of them or both of them are veterans. I kept waiting for that shoe to drop, to be like, why the fuck are you so good at fighting? I was in the Marines, you know, in his cool Keith David stentorian voice that I love to this day. <laughs> um, and, and you? Uh, Army. You know, in the Dan Aykroyd voice. <laughs> I was in the army, see? <laughs> uh, but, I mean, also, the fight is definitely, like so much in this movie, representative of trying to get someone to see and care about the problems in society 
when they want to keep their head down. The thing about when you're finished watching this fight, the thing that strikes you immediately is like, Jesus Christ, they are both sitting there, the beat to fuck, both of them, bruises, their faces are both misshapen, they have scrapes oh, across yeah. both their backs, they're dirty as hell, they can Lumpy, barely- nasty, bloody. They can barely move, and the thing that strikes you is that's how much effort it took Keith David, or sorry, it took uh, Nada to get one person to see. Yes. That's and that that is the the message. That, I mean, granted, he could probably pick a scrawny guy and get it done a lot faster. <laughs> but he picked one person he knows, and it took him everything he had to beat the shit out of this guy until he was finally like, "Fine, I will look at society." Oh, it took him till he <laughs> knocked him down and forced the glasses onto, and him. then forced him back to uh, to his feet. And that's how much effort it took to get one person to confront society. Oh yeah, and it's it is the sort of thing where you're like, yeah. If you have a friend and you try and get them to be like, hey, why don't you at least confront the fact that society is maybe a little shitty sometimes, if they decide to fight you on it, the whole fight being like, yeah, they're losing their friendship over this fight about society. Yeah. This is like a Thanksgiving Day fight with your uncle turned into two big sweaty dudes. He should have just picked a little tiny guy. You know, if he'd gotten like a Paul Giamatti or something. But he's be- not friends with Paul Giamatti. <laughs> Why not? Everyone should be friends. I want with- to turn people into dinosaurs. <laughs> I want to make friends with Paul Giamatti. <laughs> Sauron, you could use your powers to cure cancer. I don't want to cure cancer. I want to meet Paul Giamatti. <laughs> That's what I'm using my powers for. <laughs> I turn enough people into dinosaurs, it will attract the star of Dunstan Checks In. <laughs> and other films. An orangutan? <laughs> okay, fine. The uh, the non-titular star. That kid? <laughs> Name him. <laughs> you cannot, and therefore Paul Giamatti is the star. <laughs> Sauron has spoken! Huh? I don't know what Sauron sounds like. Uh... I assume a pterodactyl. Some kind of pterodactyl. I yeah. mean, he showed up very briefly on the X Men. I know 90s. he was. He was in the ninety two X Men. I think in a Savage Land episode or something. Yeah. I'm sure he just sounded like raw or something like that. Pretty so much. yeah, yeah, he was one of Sinister's goons, of course. Anyway, uh, but this is also once you know Keith David finally sees what's going on and is just like, oh god damn it. Well, I love that his response is, you know, he sees like rich white people. And he's like, yeah, it figures. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. <laughs> And this changes very little for me. You don't understand, Nada. <laughs> oh, I get it. It just means now they're actually aliens instead of just oppressive. <laughs> but they go get, you know, some room at some flop house, mm-hmm. basically. And again, one of those things where, like, Keith Davis goes, all right, well, what do we do now? Like, what's our plan of action? And Nada's like, fucking, I have no idea. I just found out about this yesterday. If you have a grand plan, let me know. There's one more thing about the fight I wanted to mention real quick here. There's a point where they both pick up weapons. Uh, Nada picks up a two by four and uh, and uh, Frank picks up a bottle. And when when uh, the two by four is swung, it breaks out the window of a car that that Frank is leaning against. And it's a moment where... uh, Piper comes out of his fight reverie and is like, oh shit, I almost just really hurt you. Fuck, I'm really sorry. <laughs> no, there's there's also a part in there where they just start laughing at each other. Yeah. Because they're like both extremely tired and just like leaning on scenery and they start chuckling and you're like, oh, this is the part where they like laugh and then become friends and then they just keep beating the shit out of each other. Every, mo- every one of those little moments where they have the sudden realization of how stupid what they're doing is and then keep doing it. Oh, yeah. There's also the like, oh, I knocked you down and now, all right, here, I'll give you your ha- my hand and I'll pick you up. And he's like, oh, I'm, it's good. We're still friends. Nope, I'm beating the shit out of you still. <laughs> you don't understand. This is going to go on. Right. And we do get a couple of gay panic jokes at, at the end of the fight and then wh- thankfully not when they get the room. No, because they were like, I need a room. And the uh, guy was like, yeah, OK. And I was really worried that these two huge muscle dudes walking into the flop house and being like, we need one room, please, was going to get some joke. So good on you. Yeah. The only gay panic joke was from Piper directly when he was like, he was it was some joke about like, uh, that was a good time, sweetheart, or something like that at the end of the fight. So that was the only one. Eh. Okay, back to it. Yeah, I love the scene where Piper's just like, I don't fucking know. I dragged you into this because I know you. I was not thinking when I did that. <laughs> Look, the reason I have you is because you're the only person I could talk to that probably wouldn't immediately turn me into the police. Yes. Yeah. 
Yeah, and, and uh, thankfully their their problem is resolved. Now they 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 spend the night in the in the flop house, and the next day uh, Keith David goes out for food, and when he comes back in, uh, Gilbert is in the same building and spots him and is like, "Oh my God, it's you!" and then and sees that it, they have they both are the wearing sunglasses. the glasses. Yeah, they're all wearing the glasses, and so he's like, "Oh, thank God, you're in the resistance already." Look, meet us here. Here's some details and notes or whatever. Yeah, and we find the resistance. They've got just a few people and. Some of them from the previous shanty town, mm-hmm. uh, notably one of the people, the guy he saved, and the people that were there when he saved him. Yeah, the woman who was who was with them as well. There was All like th- a father and her daughter, and then this kid. Notably, there are several children at this meeting as well, which is very disheartening. Uh, that they're at this underground war meeting about how aliens are invading the world. There's all these kids there, like I'm scared, or what kind of gun is that? Yeah, and it's it's uh, and plus, given that this this scene ends in a raid from the aliens, you're like, ah, oh, geez, a bunch of kids. That's sad. Yep, and it's also one of the things where they're like, we have to find out what the fuck is going on because yeah, we've got some guns and some grenades and whatnot, but that doesn't matter because if we kill, you know, a hundred of them. They still will win, and we will lose. Yeah, I really like this scene because Gilbert, for just being some dude who's you know as desperate as everybody else, has really adopted the leader persona because he's like, look, someone yells like, we should just go out there and fuck him up. We have all these guns and stuff, and he's like, that will accomplish nothing. Yeah, that will get you killed, and then there are fewer people to help. Plus, someone here will talk about the safe house, and then we'll all get killed. So no, we're going to lay low and gather information. And here's another thing. If an alien offers a job to you, you say yes. Yeah. If they figure out you can see them, and they try to go, all right, instead of murdering you, why don't you join us? Join up. We need any information we can get. Yeah. And, uh, and, and then that's when... Love interest shows up. Holly. Holly is also at the meeting. Yeah. And so we are supposed to get the like, oh, she has the glasses that were dropped there. Mm -hmm. She now finally sees what's going on. So she's part of the resistance. She's on her own journey of of rebellion is what's supposed to be the interpretation. And Piper excuses himself from from Frank and is like, I have to go talk to this woman. Goes over there. She's like, I thought I killed you. And he's like, I thought you killed me, too. And we have the little, you know, the secondary meet, meet cute and everything. Oh, yeah. And it's. You know, very much what would have been in another action movie. The like, all right, and now the two of us can kick ass side by side. But a raid happens and they are immediately split up. Yes, they get split up and they get fighting in alleyways against all these cops, aliens and so on and human cops, just murdering dozens of them with automatic weapons. Uh, One thing is there's another guy at the meeting who was another person who had been at the shelter. Another there's the other black guy. Um, and he was like, have you seen one of them do his disappearing act yet? They use these watches, their radios. You can hear him talk on the radio. I haven't figured out how to teleport with it yet, but I'm gonna. And Keith David ends up with that watch. Yes. And it's important because when they are cornered in the alley, the watch ends up falling and breaking. And the response to a watch breaking from these aliens is to open a like transport tunnel. Mm hmm. In the ground to some place, which seems like not the best idea if you're trying to lay low. I mean, I get it. It's going to be easier to go in and contain. Like, they're like, okay, well, obviously a few people are going to see your magic hole to nowhere. Very few of them are going to go in there. Even if they do, they'll get shot by guards. And all we really need to do is dispatch cop teams to clean up anybody who saw that. Yeah. Just go around, either recruit them or kill them. Where if they ever catch one of these aliens... That's dissection time, and now they're going to start spreading the word all over the world. So they drop down, and it looks like they are in some kind of like underground tunnel. Although, honestly, considering where they end up, it kind of might just be that they are... I think in- they're in a service tunnel, on the, like, a, like an auxiliary like janitor access tunnel that is on the top floor of a media building. Yes, because... I mean, this is the scene where they see, like, there's an alien going like, oh, thank you all for joining us, Mm -hmm. you know, because you were willing to help us in what we're doing. All of you are, you know, 
set to have your monetary growth go up 37% this year. This year alone! And, you know, everyone's just politely clapping and so on. And there are plenty of aliens. Now, the other thing that happened at the at the meeting that, that we don't want to gloss over here just because it explains the, how everything's in color now and so on, they've upgraded from the Ray-Bans that hurt your eyes to contact lenses that let you see in color and don't hurt. Yes. And it also means they are not visibly someone who is in the resistance because before... If you saw someone wearing those sunglasses, it was very easy to go, oh, that's probably someone who can see us. It is still very funny that they're the only two dudes at this this black tie, like, formal dinner party, and they're dressed in, like, dirty, shitty flannel and so on. And, and the other well, one's... thankfully, it, yeah. the only person who notices them there is one of the people from the shantytown who's yes. like... Hey there, boys. It's a good thing you came on board. You know, you should address the part now that you got the money. Hey, I'm Buck Flower, and I'm a I'm an absolute fucking moron in this movie. And uh, I'm going to take you on a tour and do everything I can to be useful to you and then get, like, dispatched, uh, disposed of. <laughs> so, you know, he shows them that they teleport all across the uh, galaxy. Yeah, they have a little airport. They, there's like a little spot where like airport stuff, the white zone is for loading and unloading Please shit is playing. have your carry-on luggage yeah. next to you in the beam. Yeah, and then it just teleports them to, and he's like, that's Andromeda. That's that's the whereabouts they're from. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we also get them going down this hall. They just end up getting to the newsroom for the local news station. Yeah, and he's like, this is where they send out the signal that makes everybody th see everything they want them to see and not what's real. Don't know how it works, but, uh, but that's uh, not what they're paying me for. But the very first thing they do is give every single person they recruit this tour so uh, we can all, you know, accidentally give out the information to spies or sell it or whatever the fuck it is we might do. Uh, they're they're very, very good at, at, at psyops, but very, very bad at infosec. <laughs> Uh, Here, take several pamphlets about how the old alien thing works. You all have a good day. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, they manage to get in there. Uh, they are caught by a couple of the soldiers. They shoot them. Right. Well, what happens is they try to talk Buck Flower into letting them into the, the server room. And he's like, yeah, I could probably do that. I'm friends with every single alien. And he turns around. And he's like, hey, my boys want to go take a tour of your super highly advanced secret maroon that I don't understand. And the alien's like, don't be fucking stupid. Show me your paperwork. Yeah. Show me the actual cards that you're supposed to have to be here. Mm -hmm. And they just shoot him. And Buck Flower manages to live through this after it, they kill a couple soldiers because he's like, bye, boys, and just uses the watch. I don't think they were going to kill him anyway. I don't think they want to kill people. I no, mean, they they do not shoot a single, like, actual human yeah. throughout the entirety of the film. There's one. No. There's well, one. There's one. They, well, they, I mean, we haven't gotten to it yet, but it, they... Well, okay, you're remembering, aren't you? Well, I mean, we don't know that she's dead. They shoot her, though. That wasn't the question. Yeah, okay. <laughs> the, the love interest gets shot by Rowdy Roddy Piper. Yep, because she shows up because they find out there's uh, the roof of this place has a satellite dish that is beaming out the signal to whatever their satellites are and making it go worldwide, mm -hmm. which is very lucky for them that it's right there in the town. They One live. more reason I think this is L.A., because that's where the most powerful broadcasting equipment is. Yeah, but... They go to head up to the roof, and that's when they run into Holly, and he's like, oh, thank God, you're here. I thought you might come here after the raid happened just so you could keep up appearances, mm -hmm. and we're going to the roof. We're going to stop everything, and Nada runs off and leaves Frank and Holly behind, and she's like, well, fuck you, buddy, and kills Frank. Yep, that's the end of Frank. It's real sad. It is extremely sad. And up on the rooftop, click, click, click. <laughs> he's up there looking at this big old machine a jig, and he's like, I, I guess I just shoot this thing. <laughs> yeah, I guess. Yeah. And uh, it, But unfortunately, he does a lot of action movie dawdling where he could have just pushed this thing off the roof immediately. And well, it's a giant fucking uh, satellite dish. Yeah. This has got a bunch of shit on it that normally you can't see without the things. Right. So he's he's gearing up to shoot it when she appears behind him, and she's like, Hey, I'm definitely a collaborator. Also, there's that oppressive helicopter again, and it's going to shoot you. Yeah, you should have just joined up with us. It's not too late. You could be rich, and you could forget all about this. And he's like, 
Eh, nah, fuck you. I really don't think that's true at this point. I mean, granted, I, I, she keeps being like, just come inside with me. You'll be okay. And he's, I really wanted to be like, I don't know. I've killed like 45 of these things. I feel like at a certain point, I, I'm sure they're very, very nice. These people who have secretly taken over our society so they can acclimatize our planet to them. And basically use us as weird livestock. But at a certain point, I feel like they're going to get a little miffed that, that I've killed so many of them personally. Yeah, I'm pretty sure... Their justice eh. system probably includes murdering me. Yeah. but <laughs> So I'm not inclined to go with you. But yeah, he has to shoot her. He gets to shoot the satellite. The I love helicopter that scene. shoots him. He gets shot in the back. He, he's standing there pointing this little tiny gun that he had hidden in his sleeve at the, at the uh, satellite. And the helicopter opens fire. He gets a bunch of machine gun fire in the back. And he just goes... Ah, fuck it, and and shoots the uh, the satellite and falls dead to the ground. Yeah, he dies with a smile on his face, just like ah, fuck you. Yeah, and we get our the movie's excellent denouement. Yep, where suddenly the signal has stopped, and all across the world, people who are being interviewed that are basically saying like everyone should just be happy with the status quo suddenly can be seen as aliens everyone on tv is clearly an alien half the people in all the bars are clearly aliens and then it ends on a little gratuitous scene that is very funny but i feel like might have cheapened the movie a tiny bit which is just someone having sex with somebody Uh uh-huh you see this woman just going uh uh so you can see her tits wobble for several because you're just like oh well might as well earn a pg-13 rating real quick (laughs) Let's get some titties on the screen in the last 20 seconds of the movie. Uh, and then she looks down and, oh, no, her partner is an alien. And he's like, what's wrong, baby? Yeah. And then that's credits. And I'm like, wait a minute. I thought they. I thought we looked super fucking gross. I guess this guy's just a freak. Oh, yeah. He's into it. Because <laughs> you know, if they had just been here, there would be people who are like, no, I'm into the weird Skeletor guys. <laughs> I'll monster fuck. Don't I'll, I'll monster fuck right now. You throw me a monster, I'll throw down. I mean, who knows? Maybe they had a signal that was making us look like them. That could very well be. Maybe he he wasn't wearing glasses, but it would have been great if he'd been wearing make things look look like us glasses. Like he just had a pair of the same glasses on. He's like, they yeah. work they work different for our eyes. You look real gross now, and I'm into it. This is my thing. I hope our exposed muscles get all juicy on each other. Real juicy. <laughs> But yeah, that is that is the end of the film, and, and I we, do I do love this movie. It's a God great movie. It. I, it's a great movie. I, I don't know if you were expecting me to shoot shoot it down or something. I mean, I knew there were definitely bits in this. I mean, the fight scene, his sudden turn into a action hero. No, I got it. I understand. Supposed to it's, be part it's of it. So dumb that it has to be on purpose. Oh yeah. That, that he that he's just this is his way of grappling with a, with a ludicrous reality that he's been presented with is. Uh, fuck it, I'm going to be like TV. Yeah, I'm going to be an action hero. Yeah. And um, then he realizes, no, that's not how things work. And the fight scene is egregious and gratuitous, but in sur- it, I mean, the thing is, I don't think it's either of those things, because every aspect of it is in service to something. Yeah. As long as the fucking fight scene is, it keeps having moments in it that are important, where you're just like the part where, where Piper realizes he went too far and apologizes. Yeah. And, and the fight just keeps going. Uh, everything the fight is in certain there are longer fights in worse movies like uh, i would say the the middle punisher movie the the thomas jane one there's that scene where he fights the russian and it's like 14 fucking minutes long and there's no point to it (laughs) so there this is a fine fight scene that goes on for way too long (laughs) well i'll go ahead and ask you then let's get into our best and worst uh what is the best thing in this movie uh, I'm going to say the best thing in this movie is probably the fake commercials and the TV broadcasts. They're very well realized and very well thought out. Um, I, I just, I, I really like that shock factor when he first puts on the glasses as the movie becomes more and more actiony and you see more, it's more and more just aliens on screen all the time. Uh, I, I feel like it moves a little bit away from how much I appreciated the stark black and white, the obeys on all the walls, mm-hmm. the, the, the brief shots of people on TV in, in their alien outfits being like, you should just be happy with everything. P- things are going wonderfully and they're only going to get better. Yep. I love that kind of shit. That was great. Oh yeah. What about you? Uh, I mean, I think probably the best moment for me in this film is the point right after he shoots down the drone with the mama don't like no tattletales Mm -hmm. and then sees the human cop. Oh, yeah. Beat uh, beat your feet. Yeah. When he's just like, 
oh, fuck, no, this isn't... I didn't like, sign up to shoot people. Yeah, this isn't just, oh, it's everyone in charge is one of these. It's much more complicated and fucked up than just, I can run around shooting people. We'll yeah. solve. Yeah, it's very it's very cool. And his his reaction to that in that scene and then the follow-up to it, just a great moment for that character. I'd also throw something really good to uh, the Holly scene when she's explaining that she's kidnapped and so this isn't a uh, a banter dynamic that the two of them get to have now oh yeah when he commits a home invasion and she's just like look no matter what you say or do you committed a home invasion yeah i don't care you <laughs> i will comply with your orders because you have a gun and you are in my house but there is no point where you are going to convince me of anything or i'm going to be happy that you're here that is insane oh yeah and <laughs> Uh, I've been spending most of this time looking up how long that fight scene is with the Russian, and it's only four and a half minutes. Oh, okay. The six and a half minute fight scene is honestly probably one of the longest things in cinema for a oh, fight in scene. Fi in fight scene history? I don't yeah. know. I'll have, to look, I'll have to look that up. Like, longest fight scene. That'll be fun to find out. Especially given that it's like, there's no scene transitions, they don't change locales. I know. Because the the Russian fight does they 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 go through a bathroom all oh yeah all the just long like the fights like the Pirates Terminator of the three Caribbean two on oh the wheel. yeah that's one of my favorite cinematic I know Pirates of the Caribbean two is like the worst one and everyone fucking hates it that fight scene is dynamic and fun as hell I know and it goes on for a very long time but it is still like oh we're gonna switch off who's fighting where they're fighting it's still one continuous fight mm -hmm. but we break it up whereas this is like. We're going to one camera shoot these two guys. Also, I, the thing about Pirates of the Caribbean 2 is that you take that snooty character from the first one, Commodore Norrington, yeah. and you smear him in dirt and let him grow his beard out, and all of a sudden he's hot as fuck, and you're like, <laughs> you're like huh, I would not have expected that. <laughs> Interesting. Hmm. <laughs> what do you know? Well, that, that must be my thing. <laughs> I guess I have a type, and it's guys that look good. It's guy, Well, it's guys that get real shitty and then look good. Guys that look real good when they're all fucked up. Yes. Uh, all right. Worst thing in the movie for you? <sighs> it's a toss up for me between the the score, which I understand to be a part of it, where it's like this is supposed to be oppressive, but God, I just it's so irritating. Oh, I get it. Yeah, uh, I it, understand. I'm gonna go with it because the other thing I would have said is pretty much just the occasional shots of long shots of an alien talking and their face just looking like a low budget animatronic. Oh yeah, I, I. But the thing is, that's still in service of the movie. That these things just look otherworldly and weird, and the effects are cheap, and they're just like fuck it. The effects don't matter. That's not part of the story. Um. So I'm gonna go with the music just because I found it so droning, and leave the uh, the special effects alone. Okay. Mm -hmm. What about you? Uh, I'd say probably the worst thing in this for me. I mean, it might just be that very last. Like the sex thing. The, at the, the aliens. Very it's, end. it's a joke. It ends on a fucking joke, and I'm like, ah, I guess it needed to, but. I mean, it's a choice. I just don't think it was the right one. No. Uh, well, like I said, the only thing we established, the only time we ever see here in these aliens' heads at all, when they talk to, whenever they talk to Nada even a little bit, the only thing they ever say to him is, we also find your species extremely disgusting. Yeah. You look just as nasty to us. Yeah. And it's, it also is just. It doesn't do anything outside of like, ooh, you put his thing in you. And yeah. you're like, eh, it's kind of childish for that to be the last thing in yeah, there. The other thing about it is it's the only time you ever see one of these aliens with its shirt off, and it turns out that the the uh, meat face thing is as far as it goes. He's human from the neck down. No, they're all blue and red. Uh, well, it's, they're true. They're weird colors, but they have skin. It's not like he's all muscle and bone down there. He's got, like, blue and red skin on him. No, when you see the... And even then, I thought the blue and red was just because they were in some fucking, like, hooker room no, with that, blue and red lighting. No, faces are blue and red. Okay. Like, where it looks like it would be muscle is red. Everything else looks like blue skin. Yeah. Yeah, but I'm just saying, he's, like, blue, but he still has skin and stuff. I was expecting him to be muscle gunk all the way down. <laughs> and I was like, why, why show us this if it's not going to look as cool? Yeah, I just... Not not the best ending you possibly could have had. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the honestly, the best ending you possibly could have had was him going, eh, fuck it, and shooting the satellite. Yeah, I mean, just having him die, like giving this oppressive helicopter the finger. Yeah, is fine. Yeah, would have been. That's fine. Maybe one shot, like the newsroom shot of people in the bar watching the news and it's aliens. That would have been enough for me. The sex scene is is 
gratuitous. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So now we are going to rank the film, each of us ranking it a score zero to five, giving it the full score out of ten. Jeff. Four and a half. This is awesome. There's enough minor complaints where, I mean, the music is the half point for me. That's pretty much all it's coming down to. And I know, I, I keep saying it, I know it's part of the story. I just couldn't stand it. And that's it fine. It's just so much I mean, droning synth. As someone who has watched most of John Carpenter's films, mm-hmm. if anyone ever says... It's always the music. That God, that score. I'm like, yeah, no, I get it. Yeah. Except for, I mean, you know, you got the couple of really... Good, Assault on Precinct 13 has a really good score. Of course, he made up the Halloween sting. Yeah. Uh, which is unimpeachable. That one everyone knows right away. Oh, yeah. That is that is a classic spooky nonsense thing. I don't even remember the score from the thing, but I have to assume it's not a problem because I don't remember it. I would no, only remember it's fine. Yeah, I'd only remember it if it's a problem. So, uh, But yeah, it, in this movie in particular, because it's not even the one thing I really like about John Carpenter, which is he sounds kind of like he was the keyboardist for the yeah, yeah, yeahs or something. <laughs> no, he's normally a Casio virtuoso. Yeah. And in this one, you're just like, oh. He, he put it on fucking blues guitar setting. It's still a Casio, but it just sounds like... Bar, dar, dar. And I'm like, ah, oh, come on, at least play some cool, like, Escape from New York type, like, synth vibes. <laughs> nope. Hmm. Escape from L.A. is probably my fifth favorite, by the way, because it's so fucking stupid. And I just love the scene where he's surfing alongside a car and the combat basketball. Oh, yeah. I mean, probably one of his worst ones is The Fog, which is sad because it should be better. And it's very not much not. Yeah. I mean, the thing is, I appreciate his camp movies for being campy. I don't appreciate his non-camp movies that end up being campy. That's why Ghosts of Mars is like, uh, oh, Ghosts uh, of Mars. Hard, hard. <laughs> so bad hard pass where vampires leans into the camp yes. from the beginning you don't cast james woods pre everyone in the world knows he's a real piece of shit unless you're like i want you know some smarm in this movie god fucking james woods what a waste of shit he used to be he uh, i fucking ah oh, makes me mad anyway i give this movie a five a five so it's in four and that's fine i, I, nine I don't and a half out of ten i don't blame you in the slightest this is a cl- this is a stone cold classic oh yeah absolutely love it it's definitely I mean, if there's a complaint that I think for most people it would be that the message is a little heavy, Mm -hmm. like it lays it on a little thick, but honestly, it's just like, yeah, but that's the whole thing is it's true. Well, it's funny because I throughout my review of it, I've been constantly calling for it to be laid on thicker. Like I really wanted Keith David to have a line where he was just like, these are the same thing as white people. It doesn't matter. (laughs) Yeah. Oh, cool. Now it's socially acceptable for me to shoot them. Nice. Neat. <laughs> yeah, I uh, I absolutely love the film. The fact that you enjoyed it makes me happy. Uh, yeah, it's a great movie. I, so I, if you were hoping for a scorigami or something on this one where I was going to be like, it stinks. Well, no, it's a good fucking good movie. Yeah, it's just a very good movie. Nine and a half. If you haven't seen it, go see it. It's. Even with the few weird little flaws of the time, as far as like, you know, like we were saying with the makeup. Oh, yeah, it's 88. And and, and, uh, this is one of the two movies that Carpenter made for, I think it's not his first studio, but it was his first major studio or something. Yeah. I think he made it for, what, Alive or whatever it's called. And it's his only, you know, it's shoestring budget. Him, everything, producer, director, writer. Yeah. Everything. Yeah. This has like eight more dollars than a trauma movie. So it's (laughs) taking that into account. This is incredible. Yes. So, yeah. Thank you so much for joining us. It has been an absolute delight to talk about this. And we are going to talk some more about some old Nickelodeon programming over on TV Mastery. If you join us on Patreon. Mm, I think we might be talking about. uh, Oh, it's all of that. It's all that. Yeah. No bags of chips on this one. Hmm. Just all that. <laughs> I would love to quote the opening lyrics, but I didn't understand a word of them. <laughs> That's fine. Mm-hmm. This is my first time watching all that, and I've got opinions. I bet you do. Yeah. Uh, so <laughs> we are going through SNCC. We watched all that for this week's episode. Yeah, we've gone through so far. We've gone through Clarissa, Pete and Pete. Uh, and uh, Roundhouse, 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 and now we're up to all that. We've got a few more to go as we make our way through the opening lineup of Snick. So come on in and check it out. Oh yeah, join us over at Patreon.com/slash System Mastery. The five dollar level it not only unlocks our TV Mastery show, which is 
some great programming, but had it a good also time with unlocks it. all of our expanded, expounded universe. It unlocks our bonus content for System Master And the Afterthought. Everything we've got at that level. Plus the football phone and the swimsuit edition. <laughs> but that's not all. Oh, wait. Yes, it is. <laughs> it is all. We don't even get those last two things. <laughs> I think you might have to give us a lot more money to get a swimsuit edition. Yeah. You'd probably have to give us at least a couple more dollars <laughs> for us to go buy a swimsuit edition and then send it to you. Oh, I figured it was going to be that we would make a swimsuit edition. Oh, I know you did. Yeah. Y- your your whole plan is to just send them a sports salute, but those things have gotten extremely unpleasant. <laughs> I would say that- Oh, uh, fully- yes. They used to be the height of culture. Well, no, I, I wouldn't say- I, Here's the thing. I'm not saying that they're skeevy or anything. What I'm saying is that there's no swimsuits anymore. And as a swimsuit aficionado, I like to look at fine bikinis. I'm not like, oh, she's wearing a big necklace so you can't see your nipples and there's airbrushing. Oh, she's wearing nothing but facing the other way. Oh, Oh, she's wearing paint. I'm like, bring back the swimsuits. I like swimsuits in my swimsuit edition. Oh, look at you. All right. That's all I'm saying. Uh, I'm a swimsuit fetishist and I need swimsuits. <laughs> wait, ha- hold on. I'm a swimsuit kinkster. Wait, I'm a swimsuit fancier. Aficionado. <laughs> swimsuit fetishist would imply that I can't get off without a swimsuit around. And that is that is a scurrilous rumor. <laughs> that is demonstrably not true. <laughs> To demonstrable it, I'll I'll need several more dollars. <laughs> Thank you for joining us. Again, if you want to, head over to patreon.com slash system mastery. If you can't do anything for us that way, but still want to support us, give us a like, five stars, subscribe to the channel, hit that bell. Wait a minute, we're not on YouTube. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, definitely hit the bell anyway. I mean, you know, hit a bell. find a bell and hit it. Go to Arby's, see if they still have a bell there. The one near us does not. They've, yeah. I, I'm sure that thing just got annoying and they took it out. Oh, it got annoying 20 years ago. Yeah. I'm sure that's not why. It went back. The, Ar- the Arby's near us remodeled recently and they put the bell back in when they finished the remodel and then like a week later it was gone. Yeah. <laughs> they were like, fuck this thing. Why did we put a bell, a, a customer accessible bell in here? The whole point is to be like, oh, you <laughs> ring it if you had a good time. You're and- like, no, I was at Arby's. Clearly I didn't. I'm ringing this to be an <laughs> asshole. <laughs> Uh, anyway thank you so much for joining us we'll be back in another couple weeks with more movie mastery and until then you have a good one <laughs>